So, uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to give you, a, it's going to be a heroic effort to uh, summarize uh, the, or, you know, give you a high-level talk on low-level analysis. So uh, try to explain to you uh, what are the hurdles that we have when we think about how to normalize and how to work with technical variability in single-cell RNA-seq data, what are the current efforts, and where are our challenges. So, um, All right, I guess I can just use this. So uh, when we look at single-cell RNA-seq data, uh, as, as some of the speakers before me talked about, uh, we have all of this amazing variability that we can see and we can uh, learn uh, new things about biology from it. Uh, but we need to be very careful when we look at this data as it comes out of the sequencer. And the reason is that in addition to the biological variability that we have between single cells, an additional component that really dominates the variability is the technical components uh, and technical variation. When we talk about technical variation, I kind of laid out here a list of a few of the factors that, that are what we, what we call a technical variation. So the first thing that we, that we have there that we need to think about is that we have many, many RNA-seq libraries, and each one of them can have a different quality and a different depth to it. Uh, another thing, another component that is uh, very strong, uh, confound single cell data quite a lot, is the fact that we, the fact that we have limited sensitivity. Uh, and that means that we can miss a lot of genes, and in some ways we can also meet a lot of interesting cells. Uh, some more uh, idiosyncrasies for single cell data is the, uh, the presence of doublets and dead cells in our wells. Um, and some enhanced effects of uh, gene-dependent biases, and of course, the everlasting batch effect. So uh, where is it all coming from? So I'm kind of trying to think about uh, all of these factors and, and which parts of the, of the uh, technologies give rise to them, right? So basically, we're trying to think about what in those technologies distort the picture from the biological data to the files that we uh, end up seeing. Now, uh, it's kind of hard to make generalizations when you look across different technologies. Uh, there are some parts of them that are more important, some parts that are less important for this issue, uh, and uh, they are different in, in many ways, so it's, it is hard to make generalizations, but uh, I just summed up with the three main contributors uh, to, these, uh, to these technical variations. So the first one has to do with um, basically taking the cells from the biopsy uh, to, to capture and to lysis, and when we do that, it can create things like um, uh, biases that are related to cell properties, like the size of the cell, the, the position of the cell, or the timing um, uh, that it took, basically, to, uh, from, from getting the cells until lysis. Uh, it can also introduce some variation in the amount of liberated RNA, which uh, already introduces some noise. Uh, the second part has to do with mRNA capture and RT. So um, again, in this, in this part, we, we, have, we can have quite a lot of uh, a, a vari variable efficiencies, for example, because of bead-to-bead -bead, uh, variation uh, and, and limited sensitivity that gives rise, again, to uh, the limited coverage that we get in single-cell data. And finally, everything that has to do with amplification, amplification bias, uh, things in, in PCR amplification that, uh, that create bias in things that are gene-specific properties like GC content and length. Uh, of course, this has been, uh, is addressed to some extent when we're working with UMIs. Okay, so this is the problem that we have. We have all of these uh, confounding factors, uh, and this is just to convince you that these confounding factors are indeed important. So when we have single-cell RNA-seq data, FASTQ files, we can take them and then we can extract from these files a very long list of parameters or features that, uh, that can give us some indication, some proxy for these uh, different quality uh, issues that I talked about before. So here I laid out some of them, and some of them have to do with, with the depth of the library. Some of them have to do with the alignment statistics. Some of them have to do with possible gene-level gene biases that we have in the data. And the bottom line, what I want to show you here, so we have two sets of parameters here. One is, is for uh, 10x uh, drop-based data uh, with UMIs. The other one is for the SmartSeq2 protocol. The bottom line is that whichever data you are looking at, if you take the data as it is unnormalized, uh, these factors will confound the data very much. So what we see here on the left, this is 10x data on T cells from humans, about 4,000 T cells. And if you take these, uh, these quality metrics and we correlate them with the first principle components, we see very, very high correlation, which means, for example, that the first principle component is, can be almost entirely explained by depth. And this below here is a TSNE plot of the same data. 
A uh, similar thing we see uh, in SmartSeq2. So in this picture, we, we see uh, some data from mouse T cells uh, uh, of about 300 cells, much better coverage. But still, if the data is un unnormalized, it is very strongly confounded by these technical factors. All right, so this is the problem. Uh, now, to make this problem uh, even harder, uh, so, so here's is, here is, here is the problem. We cannot simply remove it. And the, fact, the reason we cannot simply remove it is that a lot of these confounding factors are confounded with biology. So um, it, this looks a bit like an ice cream, but it's supposed to, be to, uh, to show you that we, have, we can have like different cell types that go together into one analysis, right? So um, the first thing that, that kind of a cell intrinsic property that is important but can give rise to libraries of different quality that we don't really want to normalize is the size of the cell that correlates with the RNA content of the cell, that we correlate with how many genes we can detect and how good the library is going to look like. So here we need to be very careful. These are some results from a recent review that John wrote we can see that as you go in cell cycle, the, the, the RNA content of the cell increases or decreases as you uh, follow uh, development. <laughs> Uh, some more speculations about things that can, uh, that can contribute, so biological properties that can contribute to something that we look like technical variability has to do with uh, the milieu of genes that are expressed by the cells. So for example, in some cases, the cells can have tendency to more express more transits that are short. Uh, and this is one example. If we, uh, for example, look at transition, the T cells go from oxidative, oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis, which is very important. It also comes together with a reduction in the average transcript length, which can give rise again to libraries that look like they are not as well and not as good. And this is something that we don't really want to correct when we do normalization. Um, okay, so, so we have this problem now, right? So we have all these confounding factors that are confounding in biology, uh, but we want to normalize for it. We want to eliminate these technical factors. So um, what ideally what we want to do is we want to have some technical standards. We want to have some things that are invariant. We can put them in our libraries and use them for control. Of course, the, the problem with single cell RNA seq data is that there is no really a notion of a true technical replicate. We cannot profile the same cell twice. Um, but instead, uh, the approach here is to, is, is to use these kind of invariant standards uh, that are added to the cells. Uh, and one type of these are, as many of you uh, probably know, are the spikings, which are basically exogenous RNA molecules that come in predefined concentrations that we introduce to the cells during lysis. So basically, every cell has these, this, uh, every, every cell has these uh, RNA molecules that we know how many of them should be inside the cell. And then we can use this information to basically estimate uh, the total RNA quantity in the cell and also things that have to do with technical variation, at least post lysis. Uh, another uh, cool uh, technology that was introduced quite a while ago, but not really, uh, it didn't really catch up uh, uh, too far as the pull, pull and split. But basically what we do, we take in this case, we take let's say 10 cells, lice them together and then separate in, in the mix into 10 wells. So, and then the differences between these wells uh, should reflect some sort of what is, how does technical variability looks like. And this can be taken into account in an analysis. Now uh, the problem with these, uh, with, so these two technologies uh, are helpful especially the, the spike ins has been used uh, quite a lot. Uh, but the caveats here is uh, um, in the spike ins the most um, popular one is the ERCC collection. Um, the problem with this one is it's been shown to be maybe not too reliable to, to, var to vary between technical uh, um, um, replicates. And also the properties of these RNAs are intrinsically different from the properties of RNAs uh, that are endogenous in terms of their GC content and in terms of their length. Uh, but maybe more importantly, both of these technologies, uh, especially, um, I guess both of them, it is still debatable uh, to what extent they will be useful or they can be uh, convincingly uh, embedded into the uh, key technologies, especially the drop-based technologies. Right, okay, so this is, the, this is our problem so far. So we have all of, these all of these confounding factors to the data that are confounded with biology. Uh, and when we go to technical standards, it's, uh, uh, th there are some uh, ifs and buts there. Right, so, uh, so we, didn't, we do need to do an, a normalization here, and this is how a general normalization pipeline is going to look like. Uh, there are many steps here that have to do with, uh, with scaling, with, uh, with, handling with handling with dropouts, and mitigating some uh, additional confounding factors. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, t today only about uh, two of those, uh, about global scaling and about uh, gene-specific uh, corrections. Um, so, 
what is global scaling? So here the idea is very simple. Basically, what we want to do is we want to take the expression of a gene and decouple it to uh, the observed expression of a gene and decouple it to the size of the library, some, some, con some contribution from the cell, and the real expression of that gene, right? So um, uh, from the bulk era uh, 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 type of methods, of course, the simplest method would be to take every cell and just divide the, the reads by the number of, of reads that we have totally uh, in that cell. Uh, this is, of course, can be a bit sensitive to, uh, to transcripts that, that, are, that have very high counts in them. And there are more robust methods like DSEQ and other methods that go kind of for the median and give us nice and robust scaling factors. Uh, the problem with these scaling factors are the first one, uh, the problem with applying them to single cell data is the first thing is we have zero inflation. We have a lot of zeros in, the, in single cell data that can make some of these methods uh, not so useful. Uh, the second problem is that uh, these methods make assumptions, especially about the fact that um, our samples, the number of differentially expressed genes is not very high. Is, less than a half, which is not necessarily the case in single cell data. And this is, again, a result from the same review uh, from, uh, from John and colleague, uh, John Marioni and colleagues, that basically what they've shown is that if you use these methods, they can give rise to estimations of, of scaling factors that are either overestimation of or underestimations of these factors. So uh, going to the uh, single cell uh, normalization factors, so we have kind of two families of these, of these, uh, of these algorithms. The first one is based on spike ins kind of taking, this, taking the information from them, the variability between different libraries in order to derive scaling factors. The second one is, uh, is kind of a, a neat approach, which is basically pull cells together. Uh, and this basically gives you a way to, uh, to do two things. The first thing it, it gives you is a way to uh, account for the dropouts, because if I have a zero in one cell, but in the neighbors it's not a zero, so I can still use that to do scaling properly. Uh, the second thing is that it, it can be aware for the presence of subpopulations, so I'm not basically having like one big scaling factor, but in, I'm, I am sensitive for the, maybe the presence of cells with a larger RNA quantity versus cells with lower RNA quantity. Uh, and uh, if we look at the same simulation data, this is this method uh, on the right called SCRAN, and you can see that the scaling factor that it, that it infers are actually uh, uh, more correct. Uh, but the thing is, is, global scaling is enough. Basically, taking the, the RNA, you know, the, the count result or the UMI result and just dividing it by, by a single number, this is nice, but in some cases, it is not enough. After we divide by this one number, we can still have a lot of confounding factors uh, in the data. And this is one result from a recent paper um, uh, that came up that shows that even after scaling, in, in some genes, in many genes, we still see a correlation between the scale value of the gene and the depth of the library. Uh, and we can see the same thing. This is a test we've done in my lab. We can see also the same thing in, in 10x data. Uh, to make things even more complicated, uh, there are other uh, confounding factors that go into the data that are very, very hard to eliminate only with, uh, with uh, scaling. And this has already been shown in the bulk level data. One of them is batch effects. And we can see here again the T-cell data. If we scale it, we still see a very, very strong batch effect. So how do we uh, address this? Oops, I'm already running out of time. So, um, yeah, so how do we address this? So, um, so here, here is basically how, how a model would look like. So um, the, the idea here is basically to, to take every gene and model it, uh, decompose the expression that we see by contribution of different effects to the gene. Uh, and these are the different contributions that you can see here, all the co different combinations between known effect and desired effect, unknown, undesired, undesired, known, and so on. Um, so basically, we take every gene and we want to take the contribution from these different aspects to that gene, right? So known wanted, for example, would be what is the biological condition. Uh, known unwanted would be batch effect or quality factors. Uh, unknown and unwanted are things that we can derive from the data uh, using, uh, for example, negative control genes, housekeeping genes. Uh, and unknown wanted, again, are things that we can derive from genes that we, that we think that there is interesting variation going on there. Um, and all of these things can be kind of implemented into a model. These are two uh, uh, examples for such models. We have Scalar, which uses the composition of the mean, and, and SELVM, which uses the composition of, of the variance. But the idea is they say, basically, take the data and decompose it to these components, and then only leave the ones that we care about, the ones that we want to work with. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, skip this. 
and just uh, end up with saying that um, uh, there are many, many ways that we can normalize data. Uh, and there are many different considerations of how we want to build these kind of models. We can scale or we cannot scale. We can take a, a, a given scaling method or another scaling method. When we build a model, we can take you know, any different subsets of these, of these different covariates, known and wanted, unknown and unwanted, and so on. So the question is, which one should we take? Um, so the, the reality of data normalization is that there is no one method fits all. Um, and uh, this is something that we've been working on, trying to, to think about how to do that. And uh, this is a method called SCONE that we've developed. And basically, the idea is to flip the problem on its face. And instead of trying to develop a normalization method, what we've done is to develop a way to evaluate how good a normalization method is. So the idea in SCONE is to consider many, many different, many different uh, normalization methods and come up with, with ways to, uh, to evaluate them, which gives us, at the end, uh, something that can be um, uh, a good and robust normalization. I'm just going to skip to the end here and say that, um, in summary, I showed you what are the, the challenges that we have. Basically, the big challenge to separate technical from biological uh, variation. Um, and uh, as we go ahead, you know, what are the, the main, the main uh, challenges that, that, we, that we need to address here? So I think that the, the most important questions are how to address the unknown, the dropouts and the cells that we, that, we, uh, that we not observe in our data, how to identify doublets, and maybe the most important thing is how to think about best practices for normalization. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much.